So I finally managed to get my hands on the Tinkerboard. Does it do everything the company claims? Will it make a dent on the Raspberry Pi market share? Find out in this video. My mate over at Nova Spirit Tech and I have done a review collaboration with this board. I'll put links to his video at the end so you can go and check out what he thinks of the board. If you're a regular subscriber, you would be used to my gags by now. Unfortunately, I didn't have time for one this week, so I've just got this boring intro. Okay, you can, you can cut now. What under that snazzy cut secret? Ah! For those of you who missed out on Mick Mail number 9, here's a sped up unboxing for you. So here we have the newly claimed Pi Killer. It looks pretty innocent, doesn't it? The reason why everyone is getting upset about this new board is that it is squarely competing with the Raspberry Pi. I don't need to go through my usual walkthrough of I.O. options, but it is electrically identical to the Pi. However, there are several key differences. There's an SPDIF output, gigabit Ethernet instead of 100 megabit, HD 192kHz 24-bit audio, power on and reset button headers, an IPEX antenna header, color-coded GPIO header, the Rockchip quad-core RK3288 SOC, and on the flip side, we have 2 gigs DDR3 RAM. Not only is this a step up from the Humble Pi 3, but it is physically identical as well. From every side, headers, connectors and ports have been placed in exactly the same position. This, of course, means that it will fit into any Pi case. Comparing them side by side, you can see a far greater track density. Whether this causes problems or not, time will tell. One of the annoying design decisions was the use of the projectile weapon SD card socket. Yeah. Inside the box you also get a fairly decent heatsink. Sticking it on is fairly straightforward, however I started my tests without it. Then it was the usual keyboard and mouse, ethernet, HDMI and finally power. I used my bench power supply set to 5.2 volts to account for cable length and used an inline voltage and current logger to keep track of things. Once powered on, it had dropped into a boot crash cycle. Not looking good so far. Measuring the 5 volt rail shows that it dips down to 4.6 volts during boot, which is a little low and out of spec for most ICs. So beefed up my bench power supply to 5.3 volts, which ended up being close to 5 volts and within spec, and allowed the board to boot without issue. During boot I saw a peak current of 1.7 amps, which is the highest boot current draw I've seen out of all the SBCs so far. The idle current settled down to around 417 milliamps, putting it in line with most SBCs. Connecting to Wi-Fi was straightforward, likewise Ethernet connected without issue. So now that I have everything connected up, I wanted to see what the Wi-Fi and Ethernet performance was like. Ethernet TCP bandwidth came up with an impressive 940 megabits per second. UDP tests came up with a jitter of 0.349 milliseconds and no packet loss. Moving over to Wi-Fi, I saw a respectable 56 megabits per second on TCP throughput, which is close to the theoretical maximum, and UDP saw 1.3 millisecond jitter with no packet loss. Nice, seems to perform really well. So I went through an upgrade cycle and started to install all the Forionic software and dependencies. This is where I hit more issues. I started getting errors on the USB side, memory management and DMA errors. It would either completely crash the board and reboot, or else it will lock up solid. Not looking good. I managed to isolate it down to the Ethernet drivers, so I disabled and disconnected. Then everything just worked after that. I had the same experience when using Ambien later, so Ethernet drivers are a little dodgy at the moment. Since we have a beefy sock on board, overheating was to be an issue, so I ran a Pharonix test that historically overheated CPUs and removed the heatsink. Very quickly the temperature rose from around 46 degrees idle to a peak of almost 75 degrees and with a huge amount of throttling. Putting the heatsink back on didn't see much change in temperature. In fact, no change at all. This was because no air was moving around the heatsink. Average frequency did improve, so it wasn't throttling as much. Going overboard with my huge heatsink saw a huge drop with a max of 50 degrees. That's 25 degree difference. The CPU also stayed at 1.6 GHz almost the whole time. So the supplied heatsink seems to work well, but it would be far better with a fan. 
So, on to GPIOs. It seems this kernel has everything it's promised on the company blurb. Let's see if it all actually works. Seems we don't have access to control the onboard LEDs. Oh well, not a big issue there. ASUS have provided a C and Python API based on Wiring Pi that you can use to access and control the GPIOs. Building is all pretty simple and at the end of it you get an executable called GPIO. This will show up all your GPIOs and their current state. From there you can export a GPIO and set it high, or oh, okay, maybe not, that doesn't really work, but doing it manually does. It doesn't even support unexporting the GPIO pins, so clearly their API needs a bit of work still. On to I2C. We have six I2C buses, one of them connects to the HDMI port. Using my I2C based LUX sensor, attach the first I2C port. It appeared on the correct bus at address 39. And yep, that works okay. And what about SPI? Using my MAX7219 and 3.3 to 5 volt logic level converters, it should have worked, but it didn't. So attaching a logic probe, I discovered that data was being sent out on the SPI bus, but for some reason wasn't correct. So that's another thing that's not working properly. This board has a fully fledged MIPI CSI connector. That needs to be tested. It turns out you need to do some fancy footwork to get it going. By default, it doesn't work with any of the standard webcam apps. Just run everything as mentioned, and you end up with several snapshots placed in the slash temp slash ISP tune directory for some bizarre reason. Seems to be working okay, I guess. The Tinkerboard also has a PMIC controlling various voltages around the place, which you also have access to. Before I move on to testing Arbion, I thought I'd give the latest beta version of Tinker OS a go and see what's different. Seems all the GPIOs are still there, and like the previous version, everything is statically built into the kernel. A bit of an odd thing to do, but anyway. You still have access to frequency scaling, temperature sensors, and everything else. Good to see. Basic GPIOs still work, and so does I2C, but SPI still doesn't. Ethernet TCP bandwidth has the same performance, which is expected, and so does UDP. The same can be said for Wi-Fi TCP and UDP performance. It seems not much has changed in this release. So, time to ditch Tinker OS and pick up the ever-reliable Ambien. I chose the desktop variant as I wanted to test out graphics performance. It booted up fairly quickly, but a little slower than Tinker OS. A quick glance tells me that all the GPIO essentials were there except for SPI. Basic GPIO and RTC all worked without issue. Next, on to some performance testing. I bashed the board with Pharonix tests over a full day. So the results are in. How good is this new board? Is it better than the Pi 3? The Tinker board was equal with the Odroid C2 for John the Ripper and 1.7 times faster than the Pi 3, being beaten by the Jetson, Highkey and Upboard. It kept up with the Jetson, Highkey and Upboard for the C-Ray benchmark and was 1.9 times faster than the Pi 3. A similar result for the small PT tests and the fast Fourier transform benchmarks. Then there were some odd variances, like the Bullet Physics Engine, Local Loopback Network, Cache Bench, which unusually screamed ahead of everything else. Same with the PHP benchmark, but the Python benchmark was more normal. You can check out all these results on the Open Benchmarking website, but from the results I'm seeing, the Tinkerboard is almost twice the speed as the Pi 3 on raw CPU tests alone. And so what about power consumption? During the heavy testing, I saw a peak current draw of 2.4 amps with an average of 858 milliamps. The CPU was clocking at a steady 1.6 gigahertz the whole time and hitting a peak of 65 degrees with an average of 41. All in all, a pretty decent result for the price. So what to make of this board? Well, the company claims are outrageous, unlike the Pine64, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Like most SBCs, the official OS images don't seem to have everything working, but there's always Ambien. Support is, well, not that good at this point. This is where most of the battle is won. If ASUS can get some decent community backing, they might be set to take on the Pi 3, but they have a long way to go before that happens. This board is still a little bit green, but holds a lot of promise. If you are prepared to do some hacking around, it's worthwhile. Otherwise, just wait until it has matured a bit more. Anyway, um, I think Don has just stepped into the room. 
How did you, mate? Whoa! Thanks, Mick. Now, this is Don here from Nova Spirit Tech. Now, if you guys want to see more of the software aspects of this Asus Tinkerboard, which is uh, Tinker OS, hit this little circle right here or a video link right over here. And as I say in my nerd cave, hack till it hurts. Thank <laughs> you.